Welcome to chapter 7. In this chapter, we're going to talk all about DNA to protein. So the first part of this top of this chapter, we're going to break it into two topics. And so the first part is going to be focused on getting from DNA to RNA. And then in our second topic, we're going to talk about what happens to get from RNA to protein. As we discussed in chapter 4, proteins are the workhorse of the cell. So it's really important that we understand how we get these proteins and to be made the way that we need them to be made based on the genetic blueprint of the cell. So here's our topic outline. We're going to just focus on DNA to RNA in this topic. So we're going to talk about the types of RNA, the properties of RNA, the process of transcription, RNA processing, exportation, degradation, and transcription evolution. Now don't be fooled because I, the first part of this is going to be familiar to you, but the last part, especially the RNA processing, exportation, and degradation is going to be somewhat new. So don't blow off this, this first topic. As always, here's our topic objectives. If you have any questions about any of these, please let me know so that we can talk about them in class. And of course, we'll always focus on the ones that you're struggling with. So here's what we're talking about when we talk about DNA to proteins. And this is, the, this is all encompassing, but you can see it here. We're gonna just focus on the first part. We're gonna focus on DNA and transcription. And that's what this part is gonna talk about. And we have a lot of different enzymes that play a role in this process. And it's not quite as simple as you've been led to believe in some of your earlier biology classes. There's actually a lot of stop points and a lot of checkpoints to fix things. So it's really important that you understand how this all works. And this whole process of DNA to protein is known as the, um, the central dogma of molecular biology. So, and hence, based on the title alone, you can tell this is a very important concept to make sure you understand. So make sure you have a good handle on these two topics before moving on to any of your future classes, because this is what's going to play a major role in that. So before we get too far down our road of DNA versus RNA, or DNA into RNA, we need to understand what the differences are between DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA have two main differences. They have a sugar difference, which RNA has ribose and DNA has deoxyribose. And you can see that on the picture on this slide here. There's just a small change in the structure of that sugar. It doesn't change the number of carbons. It doesn't change anything else. It just changes this one side group is, is the ribose versus deoxyribose. The other change comes from the nitrogenous bases. RNA has uracil, where DNA has thymine. So it's important to understand the T's, the base T, is no longer in RNA. It's only found in DNA. And so that's an easy way to be able to tell the difference between an RNA sequence and a DNA sequence is if there's a cell present. So make sure you understand how that works. And of course, RNA, as you know, is single-stranded versus DNA, which is double-stranded. So there's that aspect as well. So just be familiar with that. So now let's talk about the types of RNA that are that are present that we're going to talk about in the cell. And some of these we're going to talk about a little bit more than others. It just depends, but let's go through this little table here. So the first of them is mRNA. And this is the code for the protein. This is the transcript. This is what is created off the DNA blueprint. We then have our RNAs, which are the ribosomes. These ribosomes are what catalyze protein synthesis. They're what do the work to help make sure that we get the proteins made tRNAs are these in-between guys that carry the amino acids to the ribosomes to form the protein and they help read that transcript from the mRNA. So tRNAs and rRNAs work directly together. We also have a couple new RNAs that you may or may not have heard about which miRNAs are regulation gene, they regulate gene expression and then we also have some small RNAs that regulate splicing, telomere maintenance, and there's a whole lot of other processes. And we're going to talk about those later on in this chapter as well as in future chapters. So just be aware that MR or that RNA does not stop at mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. So here's RNA or mRNA rather, the direction of the and it's it's the direct transcript of DNA. This is the exact copy, except for a couple minor differences. Remember, it's single stranded. It has uracil instead of thymine, and it has ribose instead of deoxyribose in that sugar phosphate backbone. And this is what's going to be exported from the nucleus and be read by the ribosome and the tRNA. So here's the rRNA. The rRNA, we use the term rRNA and ribosome fairly interchangeably, and it's actually not quite true. The, ribo the ribosome is a catalytic portion or the rRNA is the catalytic portion of the ribosome. The ribosome is the entire process. And this ribosome is actually called a ribozyme, 
which is an enzyme that involves RNA. So it's important to understand that aspect of it, that there is not, that it's a combination of protein and RNA that makes up the ribosome. And so you can see here in the RNA, there's three sites. We have the E site, the P site, and the A site. And this is where the tRNAs will dock, read the mRNA, bring the amino acid sequence in, and keep building the amino acid sequence until we have the entire primary structure of the protein made. So make sure you understand that the rRNA is a component of the greater ribosome. That's really important to understand that. And as you move forward into higher level biology classes, that will play a role um, in the distinguishing the differences there. And then we have our tRNAs. And they're named tRNA because they kind of look like a T a little bit. We simplify their structure a lot when we draw them out in the books. Um, their actual structure is not entirely T-shaped, as you can see here. They have this clover leaf structure, though, and they have these specific areas. They have the anticodon, which is the exact opposite sequence of the mRNA transcript. And then they have this three prime end, which is what attaches to a specific amino acid. Now, every tRNA is specific for a specific amino acid. It, it's not interchangeable. There's not, this one tRNA can't one day, one moment code for phenylalanine and then one moment code for um, cytosine. They will always code for the exact same amino acid. And you can see how that works here. And then there's a couple other branches that help it dock within the ribosome. So let's look at replication versus transcription. Now we talked a lot about transcription in the last chapter, and a big thing about transcription is we're really focused on error, um, preventing errors. In transcription, it's not a problem. No, oh, well, it is a problem, but no, um, the machinery isn't as worried about it. And so that means that there's a lot more mistakes that can be made in, in transcription. And so that's why we have a lot of machinery to help check proteins to make sure they're being um, they're, being, they're functioning properly or they get degraded. And so there's a couple other changes though, besides that difference. As, as we talked about, in replication, we use nucleotides. In transcription, we use ribonucleotides. In transcription, we're only focused on a specific gene. We're not going to replicate or transcribe the entire length of the chromosome. We're only looking for the specific protein that we need for that moment. The enzyme that we use for this is called RNA polymerase as opposed to DNA polymerase. And as I said, we're not worried about the error rate. And then lastly, is instead of a brand new chromosome being made, we have an mRNA sequence, and that is the product of transcription. So it's really important to understand how transcription differs from replication because the process seems pretty similar, but the end result is different. So now let's look at the process of transcription. We're gonna talk about how it starts, how it works, and then how the product is processed. So how does it start? Just like in DNA replication, we need to start our discussion by talking about where it begins. Transcription has this very specific site that it uses, and these are called initiation sequences. This initiation sequence can also be known as a transcription, um, a transcription initiation area. And so what it has is there's these promoters that bind to specific sequences on the DNA. Now, the eukaryotes and prokaryotes differ significantly between this. Prokaryotes use a sigma factor with two initiation sequences for the promoter to bind to, and it will bind there and then move forward. At this point, the RNA polymerase then starts functioning in a variety of roles, such as opening the uh, DNA and replacing helicase, as well as uh, um, functioning as DNA polymerase by building the mRNA transcript. So it's important to understand that. In eukaryotes, we have a specific region called the TATA box, T-A-T-A, -T -A, and hence the code, it's, it, that's the exact code. And what's gonna happen is we have a whole complex of enzymes known as the initiation, um, the transcription initiation complex. Now, I don't expect you to know all the components of it, but I do expect you to understand that there is a complex and, that's, and it requires all these roles, there are all these enzymes in order to function properly. So the initiation complex will bind to the TATA box and then it will proceed to go through and do the and create the transcription um, sequence, the mRNA sequence. So it's really important that you understand the differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And I know that this can be tricky. So if you want to talk about this a little bit more in class, let's talk about it there. Um, but as I said, I don't expect you to have it memorized um, as far as what all the components are, but just be familiar with it and be able to compare and contrast 
the prokaryote versus the eukaryote. Because as you can see here, the eukaryote has just the Tata box, whereas the prokaryote has a minus 35 and a minus 10 region that are specifically spaced that have to be read to be um, initiated with the sigma factor and the promoter. So then how does it work? Now one quick note before we move on is that transcription has a variety of RNA polymerases in the eukaryotic cell. RNA1 and RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase 1 and RNA polymerase 3 both transcribe RNAs that are not going to be used to make proteins. These are the ones that make rRNAs or tRNAs or miRNAs or other things like that. RNA polymerase 2 is the one that's specifically used to create the mRNA transcript, which is what goes on to become proteins. So it's important to note that if we're not distinguishing it, then in general we're talking about RNA polymerase 2 if we're talking about protein creation. But just be aware that there's a variety of polymerases that have specific functions within the cell. So now let's talk about RNA processing. I know that in the past you've probably just had this RNA transcript and it goes on and it becomes magic into a protein. And that's not quite the case. There's actually a lot of processing that has to happen before it leaves the nucleus. And this actually allows for some control within the cell to make sure that the transcript is at least somewhat properly made and that there is not an overabundance of this specific transcript. So the first one is the 5' prime cap and the poly A tail. Both of these have to be added to the, uh, to the mRNA in order to be exported from the nucleus. And these can occur while it's being synthesized or after production. And as you can see here from the picture on this slide, you can see where the uh, 5 prime cap gets added and then the poly A tail gets added on the 3 prime side. And this is, it has a bunch of non-coding regions on either side of it. And the protein, the coding, uh, the coding sequence for the protein is found in the middle of this. So it's really important to understand that, that, this is a, that these um, caps and tails have to be added in order for the mRNA to exit the nucleus. So then we talk about uh, processing. As I just mentioned on that last slide, we have a lot of non-coding regions. So how do we make sure that we get just what we want for the gene code or for the protein code? Because otherwise we're going to have this massive protein with all these extra amino acids. This is where RNA splicing comes into play. So how does splicing occur? In splicing, first of all, our goal is to remove the introns. These are those non-coding regions I talked about. And preserve the exon. We want the, just the exon to be our sequence that becomes a protein. And you can see here on this example of human factor um, 8 gene, all the introns and then the few scattered exons. And we just want those exons made. So what we have is we have this and we have an enzyme called a spliceosome. And the spliceosome will locate a specific area of the intron and help create this laureate that you see here, this lasso-type structure, that will remove the intron and splice it out of the gene, leaving just the exons in a continuous fashion to be coded into the proteins. And this ensures that we have a, a, the same sequence that we need. Now one of the interesting things about this is that because of the fact that we have a variety of introns and a variety of exons in every gene just like on this human factor 8 gene is that if we were to remove certain introns but not others we can actually create a variety of different proteins based on the needs of the cell with just one gene. So it actually allows for a lot of cutting just because the introns are removed generally doesn't mean they're always all removed and that we can't signal to have certain ones left in and certain ones taken out. And that allows for a lot of different uh, protein products to be made. So now that we've totally processed our mRNA, we've put on the 5' prime cap, we've put on the poly A tail, and we've uh, done our splicing, we're ready for exportation from the nucleus. Remember, this is a controlled process. It's not something that, can, that should just happen all the time, because otherwise we're going to have a ton of extra proteins being made in the cell. When we're ready, we're going to move through the nuclear pore complex. And the nuclear pore complex is what's going to check for the poly A tail and the uh, 5 prime cap. And it's, it helps make sure that everything is good. And it's really kind of our last stop gap before we get to the, um, to the protein processing as aspect of it with the tRNA and the, MR or the rRNA, which also has their own controls. But this is another way for us to check it because the cell is always about feedback loops and checkpoints. It's really important that you understand that. So this is how we move through there. And it's always a selective permeable pore, just like other pores that we've always talked about. So the degradation of RNA. RNA can live for a long time in the cell. 
but in prokaryotes, it's usually degraded quickly, and this makes sense because prokaryotes have a lot less energy, a lot less extra nutrients floating around. So they don't leave RNAs to be floating around regularly within the cell that aren't being used. So they make sure that they take care, that they break that down quickly. What sets up these lifespans, especially because in the eukaryote, it does live to be a lot longer. And these ranges of time can be significant. Some can live for 10 hours. Others can live for less than 30 minutes. So it's really important that we understand how long these transcripts are hanging around for, because the longer the transcripts are around, the more protein that can be generated off of them. And it's the, sequ the, um, the lifespan is determined by that three prime sequence in the tail region and that helps tell the degradation process how long it should last. So it's really important that you understand that, that RNA, once it's made, doesn't just hang around forever. It is eventually degraded. And based on a specific sequence, the cell will know how long that protein should be hanging around for. Transcription and evolution. As we wrap this up, um, every, we, everything we always talk about in cells comes back to evolution. And you can tell the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic transcription because a lot has transpired over all the courses. Now, the process is still fairly universal, but there's a lot of differences between the prokaryotic system and the eukaryotic system, especially when we talk about initiation complexes. So it's really important to understand that. And it, and we aren't entirely sure exactly how they have evolved and where we started and where we didn't. And we're not even sure whether or not introns were contained in um, older prokaryotic cells or if the introns are something that are relatively new. This goes back to the jumping genes as well. So there's a lot of questions that are involved in how transcription and evolution tie together to form the tree of life that we've talked about time and time again. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit more in chapter nine when we talk about the tree of life. But just be, be uh, make sure you understand that there is a relationship between transcription and evolution, just like there is a relationship between um, replication and evolution. And this is the end of topic one. When you're ready, topic two will be all about translation. So feel free to move on to that when you are ready with and finish with the objectives for topic one.